begin. When, when we started our, <laughs> this is really throwing me for a loop. Okay. Um, when we started our series uh, looking at the I am statements that Jesus makes that John records in his Gospels, we did this for the purpose of learning more about him, to understand him better, because these are not uh, metaphors where he's saying, you know, I am, I am like. He's saying, no, I am. And, and he's taking the, the, the words that God used to identify himself to Moses when Moses was in the desert. And Moses says to this burning bush, who should I say has sent me to Egypt to tell them to let my people go? And he says, I am that I am. He's the ever-present one. He's the self-existent one. And so Jesus is identifying himself with the God of the Old Testament, if you will. He's identifying himself with the true and living God. And he's also giving us a better picture of what it means. I am, he says in chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. Meaning that he sustains us spiritually, both, both now and for life ever after. His next statement in, in John 8, verse 12, he says this, I am the light of the world. And, and what, he's, what he wants us to understand and what we discovered is that when we follow Jesus, we don't walk in darkness. We don't walk in the darkness of this world. But we walk in the light of life. The third statement he makes, John covered last week, I am the door, John 10, verse 7. We're, we're saved by entering Jesus' fold. By faith, we receive life abundantly when we believe in him and enter into his fold and become one of his sheep. He is the door that, that is a, a place of protection and actually a place of entrance. This morning, we're going to look at his fourth statement. I am the good shepherd. And so our title this morning is just that, the good shepherd. And we're going to look at it in three different parts. The shepherd, the flock, and the choice. So turn in your Bible or scroll on your device to John 10, 11, 18. John 10, 11, 18, and, and follow as I read, all right? John 10, we're picking up where, where uh, Pastor John left off last week. John 10, verses 11 to 18. Here's what Jesus says. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He was a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it up from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Let's pray. Lord God, as we open your word now, we ask that your spirit would speak to our hearts. God, that we would, would hear your voice. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's what I want us to understand for this morning, all right? If you believe Jesus died for you and that he knows you completely, then follow his voice. If you believe Jesus died for you and that he knows you completely, then follow his voice. So let's look at verses 11 to 13, the shepherd. Starting with verse 11, we, Jesus picks up uh, his, his instructions, his, his explanation of, of who he is, and we pick up where we left off last week. He goes on a different tack, though. He now picks up the idea of being the shepherd. He's, not, he's no longer the door that keeps robbers out and provides abundant life within for those who believe. Now he is the shepherd. So in verse 11, he makes this very bold statement, I am the good shepherd. And he identifies himself 
as the good shepherd, and then by extension, we are his sheep. As we read the statement, the, the question arises, how is he the good shepherd? How is he a, a, a shepherd that is good? What does that mean? And the shepherd's good because he lays down his life for the sheep. Uh, the, the, the preposition for here points to an activity that's done for another person. In, in, the, in this case, the activity is dying for that other person. The shepherd is intentional in laying down his life for the benefit of the sheep. He says he's a good shepherd who lays down his life for a sheep. That's you and me. Jesus died for you. That's the thing that, that we have to grip right at the beginning. He died for us. The good shepherd does that. Now, Jesus' death is not meant to be an example of ultimate love. We're not to look at Jesus' death on the cross and go, oh, well, that, that gives me a picture of what ultimate love looks like. No, it's, it's not a picture. Nor is his, his death meant to be something to inspire us. Oh, I just keep thinking about his death, and that inspires me to be a better person. That's not why he died. It wasn't to be an inspiration. It wasn't because he's an, an example of some kind of ultimate love. No, Jesus' death was out of necessity. It was out of necessity. The sheep were in danger. We were in danger of, of being eternally separated from God by our sin. We were in danger, so the shepherd intentionally laid down his life to save his sheep. He made a choice. His, his death is a sacrifice, and it pays for our sin. Your sin and mine. His death was, is not some mythical picture of, of sacrificial love that, that some uh, uh, professor at uh, Picca University is going to write some white paper on about mythology and, and how Christ fits into this mythology of, of sacrificial love. No, no, his death was a real death which removed the enmity, the hostility that existed between us and God. It was a real death. Not some kind of picturesque thing. It was not only a sacrifice, but a substitutionary death as well. His life for ours. That, that brings it a little more home, makes it a little more personal. His death, his life for ours. Jesus died in our place, a life for a life. We couldn't die, we couldn't pay for, we couldn't somehow come together with a good enough life to, to pay for our sin. Jesus had to die because we would have died. And he chose to die for us to pay for our sin. This is the only way to atone for the, the sin of mankind. It's the only way. This was the only way for God to offer forgiveness to a sinful and broken people. See, we don't think of ourselves as sinful and broken, but we are by God's standards. We're not holy. We're not righteous. We were born in sin, and that's what we do by nature. That's our default activity is to sin. There was no goodness in us. There was no reason for, for Jesus to die for us other than the fact that God loved us. We, we have nothing in us worth loving. But God loved us because of who he is. And Jesus died for us because of who he is. His death broke the grip of sin. And it brings, it brings repair to what's broken in us. To, to fill out this picture of himself as the good shepherd, Jesus explains how the shepherd is different from the hired hand. See, the hired hand doesn't have a relationship with the sheep because he doesn't own them. The, the, the hired hand has no vested interest in the sheep other than to take care of them because he's going to get paid. Now, now, please understand, this doesn't mean the hired hand is a, is a wicked, evil person. No, it just means that he's different than the owner of the sheep, than, than the good shepherd. He, he has a job to make sure they're, they're watered, they're led out to pasture, and they're fed. But what do we read here? Jesus says, if the wolf comes, the, the hired hand's gone. 
Because he has no vested interest. He does not know the sheep. He does not love the sheep. He loves himself. And so he beats a hasty retreat. In contrast, Jesus demonstrated his love by dying for us. We know Jesus is talking about himself in these verses because he tells us he is the good shepherd. In John, earlier in John 10, 1 to 10, Jesus had his sight set on the Pharisees and, and, and those who came before him and, and, and the wickedness of them. In this instance, Jesus is using the wolf and the hired hand more as, a, as an antithesis, more as um, uh, some way to I- highlight his identity as, as the good shepherd. The, the natural connection to, the, to Psalm 23 begins to take place. When we think of God as our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me beside quiet waters. He leads me to pasture. When I walk through the valley of shadow of death, he is there. He, God is always portraying himself in this manner. It's quite often that he is the shepherd. And Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd. I will lead you out to pasture. John, Pastor John talked about that last week. I will lead you into an abundant life. I will lead you through life. Jesus is now saying, I'm the good shepherd and I give my life for you because I care for you because I am the good shepherd. Verses 14 to 16 talk about the flock talks about us. He repeats his I am statement in verse 14 and he begins to explain his relationship with the, feet, with the sheep. Right? He says, Jesus knows his own and his own know him. That's what he says basically. Jesus knows his own and his own know him. His sheep know him. They know his voice. They know his character. They have a special knowledge of him. They, they know him instinctively. That's what know means to, the, the word know means. So unlike the hired hand, right, who knows each, each sheep possibly because I should have this many, and he may know a couple of them because for some reason they've, they've made this connection, Jesus knows each of the sheep instinctively. And the sheep know him. They know his character. This word no has a, is a present tense, meaning it's continuous and it's timeless. The higher in hand might recognize a few, but Jesus knows his sheep. He knows you. My friend Larry is a dairy farmer. And um, if you've ever been around uh, a shepherd, or in this case a dairy farmer, they know their animals. Larry had tags on their ears with numbers, but they each had a name. And when it came time to milking time, he would whisper in their ear and he'd kiss them on the nose and he made sure they were all being taken care of as he hooked them up to the, to the milker. He knew his cows. And his cows knew him. When it was time for milking and he would call them, they'd start coming because they could hear Larry's voice and they knew Larry's voice. And they trusted Larry's voice. They knew his character. They knew they might get something extra. If nothing else, a, a, a scratch behind the ears or, or something whispered in, his, in their ear, maybe a kiss on the nose. He knew his cows by name and they knew his voice. He cares for his cows. Jesus knows us. And he cares for us. Think about this perspective from the cow's perspective in Larry's case or as sheep in our relationship to Jesus. Jesus says his sheep know him in the same way he knows the sheep. In a very intimate way, in a deep way. They they know the shepherd personally. They know his character. They know his heart and they know his mind. The relationship between sheep and shepherd is is a dynamic one. We, we, We know Jesus. That's the goal in our life. This ever growing personal relationship with Jesus, which prompts the question how well do we know him right now? How well do you know Jesus right now? We can never know him fully. I'll give you that. He's infinite. We're finite. 
But, but how well do you know him? Do you know him better now than you did last year? Do you know him better now than you did last month? See, this is why we're looking at these I am statements, so that we can better understand who Jesus is, so we can better walk with him through our life and, and find in him what we need, a savior, a shepherd, someone who's going to walk with us and lead us in the light and not in the dark. See, if you believe Jesus died for you and that he knows you completely, then follow his voice like a good sheep would. Jesus continues explaining the depth of his knowledge as he compares it to the relationship between he and the Father. The Father and the Son know each other personally. They know each other totally and trust each other completely. It's part of that, that cosmic dance, if you will, of the Trinity, where, where each is, is their own person, each is God, and yet there's only one God. And so there's, in, there's this cosmic kind of union that takes place, and the Father knows the Son, and the Son knows the Father, and they know each other completely, and they trust each other completely. And it's this confidence in the Father that allows the Son to lay down his life for the sheep. Because he understands. This level of intimacy is, is really incomprehensible for us. It, it kind of blows our finite mind. It's that little emoji where the head's going up and the, everything's coming out. That's what happens when we start to grasp the Trinity, when we try to understand what it is that Jesus and the Father have together. But it's something we can strive to, to maybe bring down into this world that Jesus understands the Father the same way he understands us. He knows us that completely. It's the same relationship, if you will. He says, I, I know you the same way I know the Father. He knows us inside and out. He knows us better than we know ourselves. We know Jesus to the same degree that the Father knows Jesus. And he knows us. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your fears. He knows everything about you. Conversely, Jesus is knowable by us. He says that. We can know him. We can have the same complete, confident knowledge. So we need to grow in this knowledge as we strive to walk with Jesus. It, it takes some effort on our part. It takes some, some spiritual discipline. Prayer doesn't make you know him better. Prayer, when you wrestle in prayer with God, you come to, to understand yourself better and you begin to think like Jesus does. You begin to think like the Father does. You begin to listen to the Spirit who guides us. When you read the Word, there, there's this level of, I've just read a bunch of words on a page. And then there's this level of, these words are special words. They're, these words are, are alive. They, they begin to speak. There's this understanding that these words are God's words. And so we listen to him and we grow in our understanding of him. Have you ever stayed out of trouble because you knew it would break someone's heart who was close to you? I remember when I was a youth pastor, I, I, kids would say that. Oh, I, I'd never do that, Pastor Hart. It would kill my mom. Or I'd never do that. It would kill my dad, and then he'd kill me. You know, it was that kind of thing. Maybe you didn't want to hurt your folks. Maybe you didn't want to hurt a coach, maybe a teacher or a youth worker. Because you were convinced you would crush them. Their heart would be broken. And, and in many ways, that's how, how we function today, too, sometimes. I would never do that because it would hurt my family. I, I, I would never do that because they're, they're such a close friend. If your sin's capable of crushing someone close to you, imagine what it does to Jesus. Who laid down his life for you, who knows you in and out. Who wants you to know him. And yet we... We choose to sin. When you consider this level of knowledge the next time 
you're contemplating sinning because we do. We think about it. It may be a quick thought. It may be a little longer thought. And it may be an afterthought. But think about that the next time. Let's be honest. When we sin, we're caring more about ourselves than we are about Jesus. And when we sin, we hurt him. Because he intentionally laid down his life for us that we could be free of the power of sin. We could be free of the fear of death. If you knew Jesus better and had complete confidence in him, do you think it would change the way you live your life? I venture to say it would. Consider how completely he knows you the next time you feel as though God doesn't care. We go through that too, right? No, God doesn't care about me. He's got lots more to worry about than me. He hasn't answered one of my prayers. They're just kind of left hanging. It's kind of like God ghosted you on your, with a text or something. He's, he, he's not going to respond. We, we kind of go through this God doesn't care kind of thing. But we have to stop and remember, Jesus cares for you, and he knows you better than you know yourself. He's closer to you than anyone else in your life. Even if you're not confessing everything that's going on in your life, he knows about it, and he wants you to give it to him. You may never tell anybody else about it, but if you tell Jesus, it can go away. And it loses its power on you. He cares for you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He's closer to you than anyone else in your life. I'm convinced that if each of us lived our lives in light of this reality, we would make better choices every day. And we would experience an abundant life that Jesus talks about in verse 10. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Not that we're going to have, you know, the best car, the best computer, the best phone, the best job, the best income. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a life that's abundantly rich with purpose, with meaning, with satisfaction. Has nothing to do with the trappings of this world. He came that we might have life and might have it abundantly. And imagine, for a moment, if we really believe that. The one who laid down his life for us cares for us enough that he can give us life and give it to us abundantly. Jesus cares for you. And he knows you better than you know yourself. In John 10, 16, Jesus explains something which was radical for the first century Jew. We don't quite grasp it, but it was, it was mind-blowing. He says this sheepfold which contains the Jews is not the only sheepfold he has. There is another one. The Jews are like, what? He's got another group of Jews somewhere? No, the other fold contains more sheep who also belong to him. Is, is this part of the diaspora? Is these, are these Jews that live like in Africa? They live in the northern reaches of the Roman Empire? What's he, what's he talking this, this other sheepfold refers to the Gentiles, and that's mind-blowing for them. This becomes a racial issue. Because in the Jewish world, and really biblically, there's only two races. There's a Jew and a Gentile. That's all you got. Jesus is referring even to Gentiles back in verse 9 when he says, if anyone enters by me, if anyone, ent if anyone enters by me, he's not talking just to Jews, he's talking to Gentiles, he's talking to all people. He's talking to all people. And he clearly states he's calling Jews and Gentiles together to make up two flocks? No, one flock. Radical thinking. The Gentiles are like, I don't want to hang out with those people. Jews are like, I don't want to hang out with those people. Is that the kind of stuff we hear today even? It is. The first century Jews had lost sight of God's redemptive plan, which included all people. And I think the 21st century church has lost God's vision. God's redemptive plan for all people. The radical thing about Jesus' mission is it's not just for one group of people, it's for all people. One flock made up of Jew and Gentile alike. The Apostle Paul speaks to this in Ephesians 2, verses 14 to 16. The Apostle Paul says Jesus has broken down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. He's dealing with a church that's racially divided because there's Jew and Gentile in it. And he's saying, 
No, you're all one people. The dividing wall has been broken down. Don't let this get in the way of you being the church. We need to hear that today. Because we, we're, we're divided today. And it's the gospel that brings us together. Jesus is the answer for racism. He's the answer for anything that divides people. Jesus is the shepherd over one flock of people. There's no us, them. And Jesus fold. Jesus died because he loves each person. There's no us, them, and Jesus fold. The church in America needs to learn this. We need to learn this. There's no room in the life of a believer for racial prejudice. One flock. We're all sinful. Every one of us. We all need a Savior. See, if you believe Jesus died for you and that he knows you completely, then follow his voice. Follow his voice, flock. Verses 17 and 18, the choice. The choice. Jesus now explains the love which the Father has for him. The Father loves because Jesus' sacrificial obedience to the will of the Father. The Father loves because of Jesus' sacrificial obedience to the will of the Father. Jesus is not loved because God likes death. That's not the point. And it's not because the Father's love was a conditional thing. If you die on the cross, Jesus, I'll love you. No, that's, that's not part of it. it. It's linked to his obedience to the Father. It's not conditional. It's, it's part of this, this cosmic dance of, of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit as they, as they exist together as one God. The Father's love, which is linked with Jesus' obedience, is part of the love from eternity past that defines the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is this love between the Father and Son, which is the basis of love that God has for us, for a sinful people, and the reason for Jesus' sacrificial death. God so loved the world, that love comes out of who he is. Jesus' death on the cross, his love for us comes out of who God is. He's a God of love, but he's a God of judgment as well. He's a God of righteousness and holiness. He's a God of wrath. And, and that righteousness and holiness demands some kind of payment for sin. And the wrath is reserved for those whose sin is not paid for. And Jesus came and died out of his love for us to pay for that sin. And if we would believe that, we'll have eternal life. God's love for the world grows out of the, the love that we see in the Trinity. Jesus, for the third time, speaks of laying down his life. He spoke of it in verse 11, spoke of it in verse 15, and now he speaks of it again here in verse 17. It is on this third occasion that we realize death on the part of Jesus is more than just a mere act of obedience. He's laid down his life with purpose in order to take it back up again. He's got an eye on the resurrection. He knows what's going to happen. He's going to lay his life down again and pick it up again because he wants others to live. It's his death and the resurrection that makes Jesus' death more, more than a metaphor. Liberal scholars will say, well, you know, his death is kind of like this, this, this metaphor thing. Others will say, well, you know, it's part of this ancient myth. You know, you see it in all cultures. Others will say, oh, well, no, you know, it's just a mistake. No, his death, burial, and resurrection saves people from God's judgment of sin. It was very purposeful, totally voluntary. No one takes his life from him. He states that. No one is forcing Jesus to lay down his life. It's his own choice. Jesus is not a victim here. He's not a victim of the Jews. He wasn't framed and, oh, he's a victim and, oh, he was helpless in this. No. And, and he's not the the the... The, the, the victim of a, of a tyrannical empire where they just wanted to control everybody and so they just got to get Jesus out of the way so those, those Jews in Palestine, would, we could keep them under control. No. No. 
He laid down his life of his own power. Remember the, the, the guard at the crucifixion? He looks up and he goes, truly, this was the Son of God. And he said that because of the way Jesus died. And, and then they, they knew he was dead. Like there was no question in those guards' minds. And somebody said, well, you better run him through the spear just to make sure. And so they made sure that he was truly dead and they ran the spear into him. This, this was because Jesus gave up his life and they didn't expect it. He gave his life into the hands of the Father. He, has, he was given the authority, the right to act by the Father, to lay down his life and then to take it up again. He was in control of his life through his whole ministry. There, there's, a, there's a passage in chapter 7, verse 30 of John here that, that the officials were seeking to arrest him, but nobody would lay hands on him. And John says, because it wasn't his time. There was another time they were going to stone him. Everybody standing, a huge crowd standing there with stones. And we're not talking like the, the little pebbles that are outside the sidewalk out there as you come in. We're talking about softball or bigger size rocks. Things that are going to hurt. They're ready to stone him, and he just walks through their midst. Nobody tosses a stone because it wasn't his time. Jesus is the sovereign God of the universe who came and laid down his life for us. Jesus willingly chose to die for all people. Willingly. Chose to die for you, for you, for you, for me, for all people. He laid down his life for you so you might live. Why is he the good shepherd? That's why. If you believe Jesus died for you and that he knows you completely, then follow his voice. The evangelical church today, I think, gets all caught up on the edges of Christianity. We, we spin our wheels and, and miss the primary thing, which is walking with Jesus. We, we get caught up in meaningless debates over this or that. Theology this, theology that. We get caught up and, and spin our wheels and, well, what's the best way to worship? How should we be worshiping? We, we get all caught up in, in personalities. So-and-so is a great speaker. He has nothing to say, but he's a great speaker. I love listening to him. Or she's a great speaker, and I love listening to her, but she doesn't have anything to say. We get all caught up in these things, and we miss the point. The spiritual health, our spiritual health, is dependent on one thing and one thing only. Your walk with Jesus. It's his words. It's God's words. It's the leading of the Spirit that make uh, uh, this impact in our life that changes who we are if we will listen and follow that voice. So two thoughts as we, as we stop here. Be thankful. Be thankful. I think that's something that our culture is not so good at, is being, grat being thankful, having gratitude. Jesus is the good shepherd and died in your place. So develop the discipline of being thankful for him daily. Thank him for your salvation. It's not because you're that great a person. Trust me. It's because Jesus died for you. That's why you're saved. If you've not trusted Jesus, then do so this morning. Con confess that you're a sinner and you believe Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for you. Ask for forgiveness. And say, I, I want to change the way I'm living. And then tell somebody. Find Pastor John. Find Pastor Gary. Raise your hand, Pastor Gary. You're not pastor. You're Elder Gary. Second time this morning I've been wrong. Find, find me. Look for, for Elder Dominic. Find somebody. Maybe this person next to you just go, what was, what was pastor talking about this morning? Explain the gospel to him. Second thing, be thankful, be obedient. Jesus is the good shepherd because he's obedient to the Father. Develop the discipline of sitting quietly and reading God's word of sitting quietly and listening for his voice, of, of obeying his words. Be obedient. We can rejoice this morning. Jesus is the good shepherd. Well, let's pray. Let's take some time to pray. I want you to, um, I'm going to put you to work. I want you to pray this morning for your, your own spiritual life, that you would Find time to spend in God's word. And then I want you to pray for the person sitting next to you in the same way. You don't need to know them. I'm not even going to ask you to ask their name. 
Just that, that person sitting on my left, I'm praying for them that they would find time to spend in God's word. All right? And, and then I want you to pray um, just for the Burkheisers as they lead a bunch of college co-eds overseas. Um, college students are very mature individuals at moments and very immature at others. Uh, if you think back to your years um, at that age, you'll know what I'm talking about. So just pray for them to have wisdom as they lead this group um, and that they would be an effective team for ministry. All right? And then after you've done those, those three things, I want to close this in prayer. All right? So let's pray.